Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar on the subject of the R2 V3 standard. We will provide a high level overview of the changes between R2 2013 and R2 V3 for clients who are preparing to transition. And it's also a good overview for clients seeking certification for the first time to get a little more acclimated with R2 V3. My name is Austin Matthews. I'm the EHS Assistant Program Manager with PJR. I have a brief agenda on the first slide here. We'll talk a little bit about PJR, who we are, what we do. We'll cover some of the benefits of certification for a standard such as R2. We will also cover the transition timeline information that Siri has shared. We'll cover the revisions, the key changes at a high level, and some other related changes. We will also provide an overview of the certification process. This would apply more to clients pursuing certification for the first time. We'll close with any questions, so feel free to type those in the question field at any point, but I will be saving those for the end. And I do just want to note or reiterate that this training, this free webinar, is a really high-level summary uh, meant to provide some guidance, some information to our clients, but certainly does not provide a um, an internal auditing training certificate or replace the Siri training requirements uh, for R2v3. Perry Johnson Registrars is one of the leading registrars in the world. We have certified clients around the globe. Uh, this is certainly not an all-inclusive list, but gives you an idea of our global presence as a certification body. And we are accredited to grant certification for a wide variety of standards. Obviously, we are pursuing accreditation to R2v3 at this time and are accredited to R2 2013 as well. We're able to conduct audits to R2v3. And once we do achieve that accreditation to R2v3, we'll be able to issue accredited certificates. Some of these other standards may look familiar to clients who are certified or pursuing certification to R2, as the standard does require an EH, a certified EHS management system, uh, which can be obtained through ISO 45001 and ISO 14001 or RIOS. The benefits of certification vary widely by industry, by organization, but typically uh, these are the, the common themes. Uh, the standard itself represents a commitment to the responsible reuse and recycling of electronics and components, so being able to advertise that commitment through maintaining the certification. Um, it improves EHS performance, environmental health and safety performance of the organization going through the process of implementing and maintaining this management system uh, and the standards requirements. The standard also represents a framework for meeting customer and or regulatory requirements that the organization may be subject to drives increases or improvements to management commitment and employee engagement levels, again, through the process of implementing and maintaining those standard requirements. Being able to advertise a certification such as R2 can provide a competitive advantage or improve public image. Beyond the competitive advantage, there could be other potential financial benefits such as reductions in insurance premiums, depending on your area and insurance carrier. Maintaining the certification can help achieve strategic objectives and or stakeholder requirements. 
and R2 allows for integration with other business management systems or other certifications. The transition expectations can be found in Series Advisory 22. I've included a link, but certainly you can find that on Series website. They published the standard last July, and you can also download a copy of the standard from Series website. But Advisory 22 is where we see the transition expectations broken down, the transition plan. This is also what PGR's transition plan is based on. We'll get to that on the next slide. So the standard came out in July. There's also a revised version of the Code of Practices, and that can be found on Series website as well. <clears throat> they will have a guidance document. They will allow time for and have allowed time for certification body auditors to be trained and transition. And the transition timeline is staggered. So what that means is that the facilities don't all have to transition at once. There is an overall deadline, but there are also some criteria in Advisory 22 that dictate um, how soon or when a client organization may have to transition based on their certificate expiration. So that helps stagger the transition audits so all organizations aren't waiting until the very last minute. And then we have resource con uh, constraints as a certification body such as not having enough auditors, not having enough of availability to staff those audits before we have lapses in certifications. The R2V3 transition audits can be conducted up to 50% virtually. This is found in Siri Advisory 22. And this is something that has not been communicated in previous versions of the webinar. So we will get the updated webinar slides on our website. This has been updated in PGR's transition plan as well. So as I mentioned, PGR has issued their own transition plan based on series transition plan. It's available on our website. It identifies the Advisory 22 requirements, but also shares an internal recommendation or an internal recommended deadline by which PJR expects your audit to be scheduled in order for us to guarantee no lapse in certification. So March 30th, 2023 is not the overall deadline for Siri Advisory 22 or for all clients to have transitioned, but it does allow time for all of the certification decision-making activities that take place after the audit itself concludes so that the transition audit isn't scheduled so close to the deadline that we're unable to fulfill all of those requirements and close out the audit package and issue that revised certificate or that R2V3 certificate to you before that deadline has passed in which case you have a lapse in certification. You are not certified during that time. So what, that's what we're really trying to avoid with planning ahead and setting this deadline ahead of the overall expiration, which we'll cover in a minute, to make sure we have time to make all of those decision-making activities happen before the overall Siri deadline. So here's the breakdown of the transition timeline. As I mentioned, it's broken down by expiration of certificates to R2 2013. So we're already beyond this initial bullet point. We're no longer offering initial certification audits to R2 2013. That ended at the, at the end of last calendar year. So starting January 1st of this year, we cannot conduct stage one or stage two audits to R2 2013. So moving right along to the next two, this is where we get into uh, the staggered approach. So if you are currently certified to R2 2013, 
and your current certificate expires on or before December 31st of 2021, you'll be able to recertify to R2 2013 one more time. You do have to meet these subsequent bullet points. The audit needs to take place this calendar year. You have to close the non-conformities, all of them, minors and majors, according to CERI requirements before we can issue a certificate. And that R2 2013 certificate is going to expire in accordance with the overall R2V3 transition deadline. So you don't get the full three years that you would typically get from that certificate if you choose to recertify to R2 2013. Otherwise, if your certificate expires after December 31st, 2021, you are required to transition at your next recertification audit or before the overall transition deadline, whichever happens first. Clients can transition technically during any audit within their cycle. It doesn't have to be a recertification audit according to your current cycle. However, the transition audit time is going to be higher than that audit would typically be regardless of when you transition because the requirement from Siri is that the time has to be equivalent to the R2V3 stage one and stage two audit time in order to cover all core requirements and all applicable process requirements, which we'll talk about when we get into the uh, contents of the standard. And this results in the beginning of a new cycle for R2. So you'll get a certificate that's good for three years from that date when you transition to R2V3. The overall deadline to transition is June 30th of 2023. Any R2 2013 certificates left standing that have not been transitioned and issued an R2V3, R2V3 certificate, as I mentioned earlier, will lapse, they'll expire, you won't be certified in that interim. So again, this is all found within Siri Advisory 22, as well as PJR's transition plan on our website. They've also included a visual representation to kind of uh, emphasize the deadlines that we have here. Okay. At a high level, the standard was revised, you know, some of the common reasons, maintaining market relevance, making sure they continue to be compatible with other standards that may have been revised. Uh, making sure it's easy to translate and free from ambiguity. All of that stuff we can see in the bottom bullet point. It applies to most, if not all, standard revisions, but we'll focus on uh, the top four. So Siri wanted to really take into account and include all the lessons learned along the way, including R2 Technical Advisory Committee feedback and public comments, which come from a wide variety of sources. They also wanted to continue to, or maybe more so, be able to reflect the diversity within the industry, within the client base, within the organizations interested in R2. There's a wide variety from you know, tiny repair operations to huge um, shredding and precious metal recovery operations. There's really a wide range. They want to make sure that the standard adequately addresses that and takes that into consideration to how those requirements will be applied across the board. They also wanted to reinforce the effective implementation of the standard. So if things were difficult to understand or not being consistently implemented, if different registrars and consultants and all of the different groups involved had different interpretations, then this would be something that was inconsistently implemented and they wanted to um, keep, you know, minimize that as much as possible so that it was effectively implemented and reinforced across the board while of course continuing to achieve its intent as a standard, what it represents. Going hand in hand with that one, 
Obviously, the standard is also revised to make sure the language is clear. Any sources of confusion or, as I mentioned earlier, um, inconsistency are removed and uh, more effective language is put in its place. We're going to cover the key changes in R2v3 at a high level. Otherwise, this would be way too long of a presentation. But feel free to download a copy of these slides. You can download copies of the standard, um, the code of practices, the guidance, the uh, rec, all of these things on Siri's website. You can certainly do a deeper dive on your own time. So I want to emphasize when we're talking about the key changes that the original intent of the R2 standard is unchanged. We're still looking for reuse above all else. We're still looking for due diligence and transparency when it comes to where the materials are going and if they're being handled appropriately. Um, so that is unchanged. The standard, however, looks quite a bit different. You can see on this slide I have a photo of the table of contents to show you that the format of the standard has changed. This is one of the key changes as it's been restructured. We no longer see a total of 13 provisions. We see 10 core requirements and six appendices or process requirements as they are known. And we'll get more into what those represent as we go through the presentation, but the core requirements will apply to all R2v3 certified facilities, whereas the process requirements will be as applicable to the facility scope. Some will apply, some won't. It will vary by organization. There continues to be, and maybe even more so, a greater emphasis on reuse. There, it, this section is more prescriptive, or the reuse requirements are more prescriptive in certain areas, including data security, testing, and repair processes. <clears throat> Requirements that were not un well understood <clears throat> or were ineffectively implemented have been clarified. As I mentioned, it's been restructured. So that includes changing the order and grouping of some of the requirements now found in core requirements. And another key change is the creation of the REC, the R2 Equipment Categorization Document. It goes hand in hand with the standard. It's not auditable in and of itself. However, uh, this is a totally new concept. It gives a lot of detail as to some of those reuse expectations I was just talking about. You see a lot of references throughout the R2v3 standard to the REC. And again, you can learn um, and get a lot more detailed information from Siri's website and going through a formal R2v3 training. Uh, this is just a high-level webinar that PJR is providing to get people acquainted with some of this new information. So I mentioned that there are no significant changes to the intent of the standard, and this is echoed in the introduction. The, the main change here, again, is references to the REC. It's to be used in conjunction with the standard. It provides an outline of the requirements for evaluating electronic equipment and components, as well as then categorizing those equipment or components based on their condition. So I want to note here, and this will come up again later, that the REC is to be utilized, however, Either those exact categories can be utilized and incorporated into the R2 facilities processes, or the facility can use a cross-reference to demonstrate to an auditor how the categories they use correlate to the categories spelled out in the REC. So that will be for each organization to decide whether they absorb those categories or see how um, they integrate and have a cross-reference available for reference. I mentioned earlier that the process requirements will vary by organization, what applies to them and what doesn't. The applicable process requirements will be listed on the R2 certificate. So that is a change that I wanted to note here. 
There are a lot of new or changed terms in R2v3. I tried to highlight some of what they might be. So again, you can review the standard and these slides in more detail on your own time. If you're not familiar with some of these terms or how they apply, I would recommend reviewing those. Moving right along, the core requirements, those 10 core requirements are, again, reorganized uh, compared to the 13 provisions in R2 2013. We're not going to go through this line by line. Uh, there's just not enough time for that, and this is not a formal Siri training. However, it's important to note some of these criteria as you're preparing to transition or help make sure you're on the right track as you get ready for your transition audit. The scope is spelled out really clearly in core requirement one, all the things it needs to include. And some of these things are new. We need to see the um, all of the core requirements as well as any applicable process requirements, for example. So this is the scope of certification, not necessarily the, the scope on the certificate, but the scope of the management system, certainly. And in some cases, the scope statements are very similar. Services outside of facility, but still related to the facility's operations can include offsite collection, mobile data destruction, services performed at a customer's site. Just to kind of get the ball rolling there, um, there can be some examples of those external processes and activities that are under the R2 facilities control that maybe get overlooked or have been overlooked in the past. The certificate itself needs to reflect several things, some of which are new, some of which are not. As I mentioned, you'll see the process requirements. Um, there are not currently any allowances, but if there are in the future, they would be listed just as they were for R2 2013. And we are now required to include all legal names and legal entities associated with the certifiable activities or the R2 facility. A new requirement here is to ensure that the R2 facility publicly communicates and maintains on an ongoing basis a list of all its locations that are not certified to R2, but are owned and operated by the R2 facility and are used to manage used or end of life electronic equipment, components or materials. So over the years, we've had many instances of misleading advertising or by not stating otherwise, giving the impression that all of the R2 organization's sites are certified to R2, whereas it may have just been one or two locations. Um, and after you know so many attempts to try and get clients to advertise that more clearly, I think they're you know adding this additional layer so that the responsibility is on the R2 facility to clearly communicate all of that information. There's also a caveat that organizations won't be able to achieve certification if they have um, fraudulently marketed their R2 certification within the last 24 months or participated in illegal activities. I mentioned earlier that the intent of the standard is unchanged. So core requirement two doesn't have any significant changes. We do see um, adjustments made to the numbering of the sections. We have core requirements instead of provisions, but reuse is still the number one priority when it comes to R2v3. And disposal is still the last choice. We still see requirements in most cases for certified EHS management systems. The standard requires exposure evaluations for hazardous substances with additional industrial hygiene monitoring requirements if high, higher risk activities are utilized, such as materials recovery. Core requirement four covers legal and other requirements, including legality of export and import shipments. And this has stronger verbiage than previous versions of the standard 
to solidify the intent of verifying the legality of the exports to include not only materials exported directly by the facility, but exports within the recycling chain, um, even if the, the R2 facility is not the one to export it directly, but a, a, a subsequent tier. So if those shipments are made even by your downstream vendors, this is still fair game. It also requires prompt corrective action to address any compliance violations and the need to notify the certification body of any notices of violation requiring action or follow-up within 30 days of receipt. So if you don't already have a mechanism for communicating that, you would need to implement one. Prohibits a variety of things like child and forced labor and prison labor under most circumstances and requires non-discrimination policy criteria be added to the system as well. Core requirement five covers tracking throughput and contains requirements for summary reports for all inbound and outbound materials. This hasn't been defined exactly, but it'll likely include all inbound and outbound quantities within a defined reporting period. It also specifies the contents of those records, such as ensuring they contain accurate dates and detailed descriptions, nothing vague um, or misleading. There is a requirement in R2B3 to not store R2 controlled streams or materials with a negative value for more than one year. So they need to be processed within a year unless they meet certain exceptions or criteria that are spelled out here and within the standard. Core requirement six covers sorting, categorization, and processing. This section looks very different. There are a lot of references to the REC in core requirement six. There's a requirement for a documented process for evaluating, sorting, and categorizing the controlled and processed materials with a lot of prescriptive items to be included in that documented process. Again, we talked about how there are a lot of new terms. R2 controlled stream is one of those terms and you wanna get pretty familiar with that as you prepare to transition because it dictates how the standard requires the materials be managed. So all materials are to be managed and further processed as an R2 controlled stream per R2 requirements unless it meets certain criteria or exceptions. And I do want to note that the categories in the REC, if utilized by another facility, such as in those first two bullet points, can be recognized and not have to be retested and recategorized in every instance. So the first bullet point is talking about if it's coming from another R2V3 certified facility, you can recognize that category that they've applied without having to do any testing. The second bullet point similarly is saying if the uh, category has been applied in accordance with the REC, but it's coming from a non-R2V3 certified company or facility, then you would need to have a process for evaluating sampling, verifying those results, but not necessarily to test each and every single one. And of course, the bottom bullet point, you're treating it as an R2 controlled stream until it ceases to be an R2 controlled stream through your verification processes or your, process, your processing activities. And again, until you have an understanding of what that term is referring to in context of R2v3 standard, that doesn't mean a whole lot. All equipment or components are to be evaluated for data. That is noted very clearly. So as we mentioned earlier, there's a greater emphasis on data security and more prescriptive requirements regarding data security throughout the standard. Any equipment or components that might 
contain data need to be controlled according to core requirement seven, which we'll talk about next. If there are materials that are contractually prohibited from being reused, sold, or donated, core requirement seven is still applicable, as well as appendix E covering materials recovery. There are also specific requirements regarding unrestricted streams, another term you want to get familiar with, um, and there's further guidance in the REC. So, for example, they need to be handled separately from R2 controlled streams. You need to be able to justify why they were classified as unrestricted streams instead of R2 controlled streams, things like that. R2v3 does not require physical labels necessarily. You can also use barcodes or other means of identification and tracking. Collectible and specialty electronics requirements are mentioned in core requirement six as well, although there are not significant changes here. Core requirement seven covers data security. It requires a data sanitization plan be maintained with procedures to address subjects and prescribed to address subjects that are prescribed within the standard. So I mentioned that this is more prescriptive, more detailed. Uh, I've listed some examples on here, but you really want to review these portions of the standard to understand what is going to apply as you transition. In addition to that documented data sanitization plan, we also need a written data security policy which includes the need to assign a data protection representative, also a defined term, which is why I have these capitalized. The R2 facility needs a security program that should include or needs to consider risk of theft and unauthorized access in terms of data security. This section also requires levels of security permissions for controlled access relevant to the types of equipment received, the nature of data managed, any applicable legal and other requirements, things like that, all of which are to be authorized by the data protection representative we just mentioned. There should be written acknowledgments maintained for those who are granted security authorization. This section also requires an incident response procedure to investigate potential or actual breaches of data or security. Core requirement seven also requires a process to demonstrate that destruction processes are 100% effective. And this was also something that was not clear or as strongly worded in R2 2013. Devices can be shipped or transferred for data destruction to a downstream vendor per a written contract if they've been verified according to Appendix A. And this is in instances where the R2 facility is not conducting the sanitization and or the destruction in-house. So they might do one or the other, they might do neither, and they're sending it somewhere. They need to verify that who they're sending it to meets the applicable requirements to do that function of data destruction or data sanitization or both on their behalf. It still has to meet these R2v3 requirements. Furthermore, we have a requirement to have at least annual internal data security and sanitization audits to validate the data sanitization process and this needs to be performed by a competent and independent auditor. Core requirement eight covers focus materials. There's a requirement to demonstrate the recycling chain's expertise, capacity, and plan methods and capabilities needed to process the focus materials. That's not new. And still requiring a downstream recycling chain flow chart um, and we see additional requirements found in Appendix A. 
you can stop at the first R2 certified tier. So that is a change. Alkaline batteries are no longer considered a focus material in R2V3. They would be managed similarly to print cartridges under core requirement two. So this is in instances where the alkaline batteries are not, do not contain mercury, just to clarify that point. On the other hand, all circuit boards, even lead-free ones, are considered focus materials in R2V3. So you no longer need to do a T-clip to try and confirm that your circuit boards are lead-free because even if they are, it's still a focus material. Core requirement nine houses the facility requirements. This looks a little bit different, combining some things that were in separate provisions in R2 2013, uh, nine and 11, for example, or 10 and 11. I don't have it in front of me, but covering storage, uh, closure plan requirements, insurance requirements. So specifically, we see on this slide, indoor processing is required, except in certain instances, as well as indoor storage. Again, in most instances, there are some exceptions, and we're talking about R2 controlled streams here. Insurance coverage needs to be appropriate given the risk, size, and scope of operations. The closure plan is to include the use of appropriate commercial businesses to manage any electronics under their control. There are, in R2v3, there are exceptions to the need to hold a financial instrument for closure costs. Um, which is different from R2 2013, in which there were uh, different circumstances around the financial instrument. In this case, you have to meet all three of these bullet points in order to qualify for the exemption, in which case you don't need evidence of closure costs to for the financial instrument. The criteria are that closure costs are less than 10,000 US dollars, and the size of the building is less than 1,000 square meters, and the R2 facility never accepts equipment or materials containing mercury, CRT glass, lithium primary batteries, or polychlorinated biphenyls. Core requirement 10 covers transport, and this references core requirements seven and four for packaging requirements. There are additional criteria if you're transporting data containing equipment. And again, we see being called upon to ensure codes and descriptions are accurate, declarations are complete, and all applicable requirements are met in terms of the execution of shipping documents and labels. So that makes up the 10 core requirements. The second half is the appendices or the process requirements. So this is where not all process requirements will apply to all organizations. You pick and choose or we pick and choose based on the information you provide about your processes, your materials, your activities, what you do in-house versus what you outsource. Um, and a lot of this is done prior to the transition audit as we prepare for those audit activities and obtain all the information we need from you as the certification body. But let's quickly go through these appendices to make sure we have time for questions. Appendix A covers the downstream recycling chain requirements. This is where we see FM plan criteria, due diligence requirements, uh, some import-export compliance, evidence requirements, the ability to demonstrate the recycling chain or register it with Siri, which is a newer option uh, in R2v3. It also requires transparency regarding those downstream vendors or the recycling chain. I mentioned that earlier. It's important to note that the Downstream vendor references in Appendix A, if they are talking about an R2 certified downstream vendor, 
they are referring to R2V3. So if your downstream vendors are R2 2013 certified, but haven't transitioned to R2V3 yet, unfortunately, that does not count. So if you have no R2V3 downstream vendors, you have two R2 2013 vendors and five non-R2 vendors, when you are preparing to transition and you're submitting all of your paperwork to PJR for R2V3, you have zero R2V3 downstream vendors or zero R2 downstream vendors. It, it's confusing. It's not spelled out as clearly as it could be. Um, and it's a bit discouraging maybe as you go through the transition process if the majority of your downstream vendors have not yet transitioned, but that's where we're at right now. <laughs> so for an R2V3 certified downstream vendor, you can complete your due diligence by verifying the validity of their R2V3 certificate. And it's not just looking at it or getting a copy and not even opening it and putting it in a folder somewhere. You need to ensure the certificate is active and valid, that the scope of their certification aligns with the types of material and processing expectations you have based on what you would be sending them and what you're outsourcing to them, including whether the appropriate process requirements have been applied to that R2V3 certificate. So that would satisfy the due diligence requirements if you're using an R2V3 certified downstream vendor. There aren't significant changes to due diligence requirements if you're not using an R2 downstream vendor, um, but certainly the verbiage has been updated to reference the applicable sections and appendices. I mentioned earlier too, there's additional due diligence requirements if you're outsourcing the data sanitization, um, the, the wiping or the physical destruction, any of that in Appendix A, 8, D. Appendix B covers data sanitization, and this is in addition to the requirements of core requirements seven. It adds a variety of requirements around traceability, training, security, uh, methods of sanitization, data protection representative duties, a whole host of things. So if you are performing what R2v3 calls logical sanitization or physical sanitization or both, then Appendix B will apply to your certification. Appendix C covers test and repair. This is where we see testing and or repair processes being done in-house, not outsourced. The application of Appendix C also requires a quality management system. So in addition to the EHS management system we talked about earlier, you're also required to add the quality piece if you pursue Appendix C, if you're doing those test and repair activities. This can be satisfied by pursuing ISO 9001 certification or REUS, which is a quality environmental health and safety standard. So a, a wide, a large number of clients already have either RIOS or ISO 9001, but I do want to point out that requirement. Those two go hand in hand. If you are applying process requirement, uh, test and repair, or Appendix C, if you don't already have that quality management system, you need to add that at the same time. It also requires a written reuse plan with prescribed criteria, the need to process materials within one year. We mentioned that before and to main test, maintain test results for each uniquely identified item for the, all the functions that were tested. Appendix D covers specialty electronics reuse. This is going to require also having Appendix C. If you are applying Appendix D, you'll need the test and repair process requirement as well. And this is required by Siri. There are additional details and criteria in lieu of testing when the R2 facility lacks the technical capability to do this. So this is really gonna depend on 
how large of a portion of your business this constitutes. Because without Appendix D, there's still the 1% specialty electronics rule in the standard that was in R2 2013. There's criteria for what happens if the specialty electronics fail the verifications, and there's criteria for if they pass the verifications, what happens to those material. There's limits on the sales and requirements that the R2 facility needs to demonstrate if they are pursuing that process requirement. So this doesn't apply to too many of our clients, but certainly review that and reach out if you have any questions. Appendix E require, uh, covers materials recovery, and this can range from physical dismantling uh, beyond the harvesting of reusable parts, but um, breaking it down to the, the different materials for recovery. <clears throat> and for, so for recycling rather than reuse, all the way to uh, large shredding operations or precious metal recovery operations. Um, so this is going to vary by organization. And the materials recovery appendix or process requirement adds additional EHS and industrial hygiene criteria, as I mentioned earlier, as well as the need to maintain pollution liability insurance. And finally, Appendix F covers brokering. This will apply when they take physical, um, excuse me, this applies when material is sourced and shipped directly from the customer to a downstream vendor, as well as uh, the nuances with um, whether or not they pass through a facility. So this is going to be, again, something that varies by organization. There are some different types of brokers, some different um, types, uh, different instances or different scenarios, which is why when we see this last bullet point, if the broker doesn't have a physical facility, if R2 controlled streams never pass through the facility, they don't have a warehouse or something like that, then the requirements of core requirement three and nine don't apply or are satisfied by the broker appendix. In all other instances of brokering though, these requirements will apply. So this exception is not applied across the board for brokers. It depends on the type of broker and the specific circumstances. Downstream vendors still need to be managed per Appendix A. This is another appendix that requires the quality management system certification, either ISO 9001 or RIOS. And it spells out really clearly what they're still responsible for. Siri wants to make sure that this appendix does not uh, turn into organizations trying to squeak around some of the, the requirements of the standard. There are a lot of requirements that still apply even with the brokering appendix. Okay, I'm not gonna go through the REC, um, but again, just to reiterate, the REC is the framework for evaluating electronic equipment, components and materials, and categorizing their R2 status throughout each step of the R2 process. There are a variety of types of uh, categories based on cosmetic condition, functionality, and data sanitization status. This, the statuses or categories are meant to be accepted by other R2v3 facilities. Again, you can choose to use the categories or have a cross-reference. Not all categories will necessarily apply to all R2v3 facilities. You would just use what's relevant. And these categories don't replace the need to have accurate and detailed descriptions for a variety of documents and records. So the REC contains R2 processing categories. I mentioned data sanitization status. I'm going through this very quickly. This is something that we're not going to be delving into today. Cosmetic categories, functioning product categories, 
specific equipment categorization is left blank at this time, they may use that in the future. And there are appendices with some advanced or increased category details. I mentioned that the Code of Practices was also revised. It contains requirements for both organizations pursuing certification to R2, V3, as well as requirements for certification bodies like PJR and accreditation bodies. So there are some key changes that trickle down to clients I wanted to mention quickly. There is a requirement to have a contract readiness review prior to a stage one audit to ensure eligibility of a candidate facility before they obtain certification to R2v3. This is actually a slide that I'll update before we post this to the website. This also gets conducted, this uh, contract review, we call it a contract validation. This also gets performed when a client is transferring to us for R2v3, as well as before our clients transition to R2v3, so those existing certificates getting ready to transition. There are changes to the certification structure, like the way they Siri terms the um, different certification schemes. They no longer allow multi-site sampling. They dictate what those schemes are called, how the certificate is going to include those other facilities or how they're gonna be listed, things like that. It allows for up to one surveillance audit per audit cycle, which is three years, to be audited virtually. So in the future, uh, once you've transitioned to R2v3, we won't be able to have back-to-back -back audits conducted remotely. Recertification audits will not be able to be conducted remotely, but one of the two surveillance audits will be able to be virtual or conducted remotely if the organization is a good virtual audit candidate. It also requires evidence of correction for minors and majors within 30 days of the end of the audit. So this is a shift in timing as well as evidence requirements um, for R2v3 NCRs. It also requires a revisit for all NCRs to R2v3. These can in some instances be done remotely or virtually, but this will be required whether you have one minor or 10 majors, um, and this is from the R2 Code of Practices. Again, I mentioned earlier, there are no R2 allowances in R2v3, but they do have that as a placeholder in case they add them in the future. So if you have an R2 2013 allowance, that will be going away when you transition. Okay. Just to wrap this up, if you are a new client pursuing certification for the first time, an overview of the certification process. The first thing you'll wanna do is obtain a copy of the standard. You'll establish the documentation and the system requirements to meet the R2v3 standard requirements. To implement those requirements, you'll need to conduct training to those standard requirements and that uh, documentation we just discussed, as well as implementing the balance of the requirements, including conducting an internal audit, conducting an, a, compliant, a compliance evaluation, excuse me, and conducting a management review, a review of the system, making sure that that includes the outputs of the internal audit. So you'll wanna have the internal audit before the management review. You'll need a contract with a certification body such as PJR to conduct your audits. And you'll also need to submit any pre-qualification information required. So again, I mentioned the need for that contract validation process dictated by the R2 Code of Practices that we'll perform. After the contract validation is successfully completed, you'll have your stage one audit and your stage two audit, which I'll talk more about in a moment, and address any resulting nonconformities. Again, we discussed that briefly before a certificate can be issued. <laughs> 
A stage one audit represents a primarily documentation review to make sure the framework is in place and that the organization is ready to proceed to stage two. The stage two is a full system audit covering the entire facility, all its processes, all the requirements of R2v3, all of the core requirements, all the process requirements um, to get the full picture of the effectiveness of the implementation of the standard at the facility. If we identify non-conformities, that would be at the stage two, although concerns can be identified at stage one. Once non-conformities are resolved and a certificate is issued, you have a three-year audit cycle. The first two years are surveillance audits. They can be conducted annually or semi-annually based on the contract, and those are not as long as a stage two audit. They're partial system audits where we sample to make sure that the system is continuing to be effectively maintained and improving. The third year of the cycle represents a recertification audit, which is very similar to a stage two. It's a full system audit. Again, before a certificate can be reissued, you need to resolve any nonconformities that might have been identified. And then the cycle starts over again. If you have not already done so, please take the time to type in your questions, and I'm gonna put our contact information on this slide. So again, my name is Austin Matthews. I'm the EHS Assistant Program Manager with PJR. I can be contacted via uh, email or the main PJR line. They'll put you through to my extension. If you have really technical questions about the requirements of the standard, we do encourage you to go to Siri as we cannot consult. But if you have specific questions about the scheduling of your audit or something along those lines, um, your scheduler is a good resource and I can be involved to assist as well. If you are a new client looking for a quote, I've included the sales department number as well. And let's see if we have any questions. Okay, so I did forget to mention, but a copy of the slides will be available on PGR's website in the next couple of days. So you can do one of two things or both if you want. You can download a copy of the slides from our website, or there will also be a link to a recording of today's webinar where you're going to be able to view that at your convenience, see the slides as well as the audio um, for the recording from today. So that'll be accessible on PGR's website in the next day or two. We don't notify you when the presentation is posted. Um, we have previous versions on the website already um, in the meantime, and I would just check back in a day or two to see if this updated version has been provided. I won't have a copy of the recording, but if you're not able to find it online, um, you can certainly email me for a copy of the slides. I can provide that. So my email is on this slide. Okay, and then we have a question about the contract validation requirement. I'm not referencing the contract specifically that you hold or that we hold with our clients. Um, it is in part taking that information to verify it before the audit proceeds. And this is found in detail in the code of practices. So I can go back to that slide really quickly to point you in that direction. Trying to remember where that was. I'd have to go back and find it. But um, so this requirement comes from the, the code of practices. It is not called contract validation in the, oh, it's right here, in the code of practices. It's something like contract review. Um, I would have to open up the code of practices and find the sub subsection. Feel free to send me an email. But what we do is 
conduct that contract validation, the code of practices spells out everything it needs to include, how much time we need to add for that. Um, so the contract validation is our way of meeting that requirement. It's a quarter of day offsite added to be conducted before the stage one audit, for example, um, to dot all those I's and cross all those T's from that relevant section of the code of practices. And again, I apologize for not knowing that clause number off the top of my head, um, but it is spelled out in the code of practices. If your transition audit or your stage one audit, excuse me, if your stage one audit is already scheduled, you are likely already scheduled for your contracted validation. Um, those two are, are very closely related. The stage one is not to proceed without the contract validation. So if you have any specific questions, you can also shoot me an email and we can talk more about it offline. But it's an offsite review, mostly documentation uh, review, uh, again, performed offsite with maybe half an hour to an hour in some cases spent on the phone or um, using virtual auditing techniques with the client to get clarification or answer any questions uh, that may have come up during the validation process as well as to highlight the next steps what the stage one audit looks like um, what the uh, r2v3 requirements look like that sort of thing hopefully that's helpful and not more confusing, but again, we can talk more about it um, offline if you'd like. Okay, I don't see any other questions. So again, check back on the website for updated slides and the recording of today's webinar. Um, if you are already scheduled for your transition, I hope the contents of this is helpful in preparing. Um, best of luck on your transition. If you still have a ways to go, feel free to tune back in to a future uh, version of this webinar. We offer it every month or two and we keep it up to date or do our best to keep it up to date with changing requirements as we learn more from Siri, as we conduct these R2v3 audits and we learn along the way how some of the things are effectively implemented. Uh, so stay tuned for updates there as well. Thank you for joining me today and have a great afternoon.